Right, shalom, hello, salam. It's uh, Tom Stuffin here for my weekly talk. Um, greetings, it's Sunday, um, and uh, we're coming up to the very end of November, so about to enter December. It's, um, you know, a time when Christians are reflecting on the advent of, of Christ, what that means to the world. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to... Um, make some remarks um, in my view what that means and I'm going to talk more broadly about my work in uh, religious mathematics so in this last sequence running up to Christmas I'm finishing volume two of my book on religious mathematics I believe it has um, you know it's it's part of my solution my intellectual solution to the problems the world's facing I'm a philosopher, a scholar, a specialist in religious studies and peace studies. And, you know, it's a formula that I'm trying to explain how we can resolve the conflicts, the cultural conflicts, the intellectual conflicts, the wars that are going on. We've just had this tragic little war break out in the Caucasus, Nagorno-Karabakh. Azeri Muslims, largely Shia, against, um, with backing from, from Turkey and, tragically, Israel, I mean, for God's sake, against... Um, Armenian enclave, Nagorno-Karabakh, um, Christian, with backing but not much from Russia, who, who was trying to play a sort of neutral game. So, And my mediation service, which is one of the few um, interfaith mediation services in the world, did you know, offer to help, and <coughs> the next day at least there was a truce, a ceasefire, but the actual piecework hasn't been done. I've been in touch this last week with another interfaith mediation service funded by the Swiss government, um, connected to the university in Zurich, at which Einstein actually um, taught for a while, or where he studied as well. And, um, you know, I've had some discussions with, with the people that run the Swiss interfaith mediation service, um, you know, there's not enough of us. We need to collaborate, therefore. And one of the colleagues there is um, Executive Director of the Conflict Research Society, where I also served as Information Officer for many years when I was just launching my institute at the uh, University of London <coughs> with the help of Cedric Smith, who was Professor of Mathematical Genetics at UCL and <coughs> inspired me with, with, you know, peace work, conflict resolution work and so on. Um, Cedric is dead, sadly, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can get a, a volume of his collective papers together. Or, you know, uh, He was quite a humble chap. He, he promoted and helped other people, but not himself. So I think in homage we should do a collection of his papers. Um, anyway, that's just all a preamble. I want to say... Um, so what am I doing? Okay, why is, why is religious mathematics possibly going to help conflict resolution? Okay, so there's Cedric. There's thousands of mathematicians around the world working on specialised branches of knowledge in maths. There's people working on algebra, geometry, calculus, you know, um, all kinds of things to do with advanced uh, scientific work. Inventing new uh, dimensions of mathematics that ordinary people really <laughs> haven't got a clue what, you know, what they're talking about. Einstein was a good example. Relativity theory is very advanced maths. Um, most people haven't got a clue what they're talking about. <coughs> if you go into it, it is, you know, it's very interesting. So I'm suggesting, okay, let's have a new field called religious mathematics. Let's get the greatest mathematical minds on the planet at the moment who are in incarnation, working with the greatest religious minds and theological minds on the planet, working collaboratively. And they'd be working from both ends of this project. It's like the Channel Tunnel, you know. One team sets out from France, one from England. They meet in the middle and, oh, well, we get the tunnel built. And you have to calculate that using very complex maths. So let's do the same with religious mathematics. Let's get a team of mathematicians, a team of religious thinkers, working together on this new domain. What is this new domain? What does it look like? Well... Um, <clears throat> and why does it matter? Well, okay, religious studies is a hugely important field, and religions are very complex. They're what Ninian Smart used to call things you die for. 
their questions of ultimate belief, ultimate meaning, you know, what is the purpose of life, what, what, why am I here, why are we here, what's, what's the purpose of the universe, they attempt to answer the why questions. Why is there a universe? Where did it come from? Um, the God solution is an attempt to answer that. Um, and it works for billions of people on the planet, you know, about at least, I don't know, nine-tenths of the people on this planet have some kind of religious context of their lives. It gives them a sense of ethics, a sense of purpose, a sense of value, and a, and a, a sort of framework. You know, it's the tracks on which the train of being um, glides. And in different continents, geographically, different religions tend to be predominant. Here in Europe, it tends to be Christianity, although we welcome a huge number of other religions that, that share the continent with us. In India, it tends to be Hinduism, but, but that's also given birth to a tremendous number of other religions like Sikhism, Jainism, Buddhism. And many Muslims also live in India, and many Christians and Jews even, <coughs> and Zoroastrians. So India is one of the most um, diverse and tolerant of religious cultures. And then the same with all the other continents. You know, in the Americas, there was the indigenous Native American religions, which still exist. They're still important to many people and have their own ceremonies, their own belief systems, their own cosmologies. And then there's, you know, a large influx of Christians of all different varieties. And then we have incredible new things uh, bubbling up in the Americas. We have, in Brazil, spiritualism, Santo Daime, um, ayahuasca-based cults. We have, in um, North America, we have new thought movements developing out of Emerson and, and New England transcendentalism. We have this idea that mind is primary, which then develops into what can be called loosely the New Age, which has been studied by Wouter Hanegraaff, a, a professor at um, University of Amsterdam, and many others. You know, I've written about the New Age as well. And what is that? Because that, again, is a huge forest of, of, of ideas, um, ranging from, you know, Buddhism to... to um, early influx of Zen and, and so on in the 50s, right on through to theosophical ideas, um, people like Amos Bailey, you know, America's flourished with all these new new religious movements, we can call them. And then in Japan, we have a, a really interesting complex mixture of Shintoism and Buddhism, largely. Uh, most Japanese um, affiliate to both simultaneously. They don't see a complex. Shintoism affirms life. It's, it's celebrating the family, sexuality, marriage, child, you know, hood, parenting, and so on. And yet, Buddhism celebrates the eternal, the end of life, the before life, the reincarnational cycle. It, it gives everything a dharmic context. Um, Africa, likewise, incredible um, <clears throat> array of traditional pagan primal religions succeeded with waves of Islamic and Christian um, you know, Advent, who, who didn't see themselves as contradicting those pagan traditions, but as fulfilling and completing them. <clears throat> the most sophisticated was, of course, the ancient Egyptian, which, um, <clears throat> from its early paleo, um, prehistoric um, pagan polytheistic roots, then developed into a synthetic, um, you know, um, complex um, uh, hermetic tradition, written down in the Hermetic Scriptures, which in turn influenced Greek thought, Plato, and, and all the Neoplatonic schools that flourished in that Hellenistic Alexandrian world. Um, you know, rich, rich stuff. And, and they also contributed to mathematical thinking. So it was the astronomers and mathematicians like Euclid in Alexandria that gave birth to modern maths. And we now know that um, Africa hosted some of the earliest mathematical breakthroughs, um, going right, right back to 40,000 BC. Early African uh, mathematicians were <clears throat> doing tally counts, grid uh, markings. Um, Dean Leprini is studying what they were up to in Cape Town, um, clocking the movements of the sun and so on, just as they were doing in Stonehenge a bit later. <coughs> so, all that's very interesting. And, and yet, why do we have all these religious wars going on? Why do we have um, religious, you know, um, disagreements, riots, uh, etc., between different religious groups? Um, well, that's that's all what we study in religious studies. 
Now I'm suggesting let's, <clears throat> you know, let's let mathematicians study this stuff as well. And my book on religious maths is, is intended, half of it, for religious experts, religious studies people, and not just experts, but people with a deep interest and love for religious studies. So it could be a student doing an A-level in religious studies or philosophy. It could be a bright GCSE student who's, who's really good at maths and religious studies that wants to get their teeth into something. It could be you know, a retired person that's got time on their hands, wants to think deeply about religions from a new, new angle. <clears throat> okay, but it's also intended uh, for mathematicians who, who want to apply their mathematics to something really important. And I personally can't think of anything more important than finding peace between the great religions and the small religions of the world. You know, the pagan, the primal, the, the indigenous peoples, they all have their complex beliefs. How many are there? Um, how many religious um, traditions have been discovered by anthropologists going out in the last 200 years, learning from primal people around the world, you know. I've tried to put all that data on my periodic table of religious and philosophical traditions that's behind me here on the wall, <clears throat> and, you know, there's a lot of mathematical data in that, but, but more needs to be done. So I'm, I'm writing the book to incite and excite mathematicians to get involved in some of the analysis because, um, you know, we need them to also help and apply their tools Two things like demography, there's a whole chapter on demography, you know, how many people are in the world now, how many were 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, how, how many religions have been developing over these eons, <clears throat> what were their qualities and characteristics. Well that's all sort of, that needs people with expertise in mathematical demography, historically speaking, to, to look at the, the numbers of the populations of humanity. Um, over time, not just now. And then there's a whole chapter on censuses, for instance. So um, many countries in the world include a, a box about your religious beliefs when they do a census. Canada was one of the first to do that, my other home. Uh, Britain has only just started doing that, actually. Um, India used to do it with the British um, uh, era, and I think they're still doing it. So they're, you know, it's of interest to the government in planning its long-term policies um, to know how many religion X, Y, or Z there are. Um, <clears throat> so obviously there's mathematical um, studies being done of, of the results of these censuses, but there are lots of questions raised, and I've gone into them in this book. So um, <clears throat> what I'm suggesting is a bit of a revolution. I'm suggesting the cooperation between the scientific and mathematical community on the one hand, and the religious and theological community on the other. The both of them. You see, there's been a war going on since really the time of Descartes, since the 17th century, if one has to date it somewhere, um, between those people that think that reality is best understood and analysed mathematically um, through developing sciences in those days, early physics, uh, Galileo was an exemplar of that, um, and then Newton at the end of the century came along with his definitive mathematical analysis of, of gravitational movements in the heavens and and really people, the intelligence of Europe and then the world decided yes, maths is the tool to make us explain reality. And they've been up to it ever since. So mathematics has had huge impacts on um, developing sciences of medicine, um, you know, scientific medicine, Pasteur, um, etc, etc. The, the study of of the cell, how the cell can be, be analysed mathematically under the microscope. Leon Wook, a great um, Dutch scientist who inspired Robert Hooke, who was the first experimental secretary of the Royal Society. The two of them developed you know, microbiology, which so much of, of uh, modern medicine depends on, and also modern evolutionary theory, evolutionary biology. And that was all possible because mathematicians married up with biologically empirical observations through microscopes of what's going on at the micro level. Um, <clears throat> and theories then developed about, you know, disease, germs, etc. So the scientific revolution has been quite successful to some extent. Trouble is, of course, these mathematicians also employed their skills to develop ever-increasing weapons of mass destruction. Those microbiologists even went on to develop germ warfare 
and biological weapons. And we may well be suffering the side effects of one of their little inventions that ran away from the lab, for all we know. Um, it's you know definitely within the realms of possibility, uh, which is why I've called for the UN to investigate that. Um, the only way to do it is resolve it is scientifically. You know, um, it's one thing to look for a vaccine, but we also have to prevent this kind of thing ever happening again. Um, <clears throat> the trouble with this revolution is that it sort of put ethics on one side. It said, okay, there's science, that's true knowledge, that's maths. And mathematicians got very, very sophisticated, you know, in the course of the 18th, 19th century. We had Leibniz coming along, pioneering stuff, as well as Newton. And then we had a whole swathe of amazing mathematicians, like the Norwegian guy, Abel, who invented all kinds of sophisticated algebra and stuff. And died penniless in Paris, actually. He was a real martyr to mathematics. Um, <clears throat> and we have others later, like Minkowski, who, who provided the maths for Einstein's relativity theory. He was, he was Einstein's teacher, actually, um, in Zurich. And Einstein never gave him enough credit in his lifetime. And then uh, Poincaré, the French mathematician, again, he provided some of the basic ideas which grew into relativity theory. He wasn't acknowledged either by Einstein. Um, but, you know, mathematicians do the work for its own, its own because they have a sense of uh, beauty and achievement in, in pioneering stuff. Um, well, that's great, you know. The trouble is that we, we divorced all that from ethics and spirituality and religion. We said, okay, well, you know, that's real knowledge, that math stuff. Ethics, well, that's just a personal choice thing. Um, and we're going to privatise that. It's left to the different religions. They can, you know, peddle their views. You can have your Calvinists or your Catholics or whatever with, with different kinds of views, and you just go to the one you want. So the marketplace of, of possible, um, you know, spiritual views, and if you want to be, you can choose Jewish or Muslim or anything. You know, it, 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 it's not important because it's not actual knowledge. It's just custom, habit, and so on. That's what developed during the course of the 18th, 19th centuries, the so-called Enlightenment. And it leads to entirely secular views of human progress. So you get Marxism as the final product of that, that you can do social engineering, you can tinker about, ignore ethics entirely, and just sort of manufacture a paradise out of, um, you know, mathematically carving up reality into, into the form you want it to be. Um, Nazism with its eugenics philosophy, was exactly the same. It, it was premised on a pseudo-Darwinian eugenics view that you can literally, you know, alter the population according to what you want um, and you can breed out, you know, the undesirables, stick them in uh, camps and, and apply euthanasia in order to breed this perfect uh, race. And it was all based on a pseudo-scientific ideology um, as philosophers have uncovered. Nazism was a sort of pseudo-genetics um, with a gloss of pseudo-religion, occultist stuff, but it, it had no ethics, apart from brutal, you know, triumph of, of, of the elite through power. Um, and, and lo and behold, if you're the wrong kind of person, you get, you get burned, killed. That's not ethics. Okay, so how can we how can we now? So the other thing about religious mass is it's the beginning, the re-beginning of a reconciliation of this dialogue, resuming it after Descartes <laughs> sort of divided them. And Francis Bacon did the same. Francis Bacon didn't put religions into his wonderful book, The Advancement of Learning, and he said specifically, "I'm not putting it in now because it's too dangerous." Those are the times of you know religious wars all over Europe, and he felt rightly that if he, as a moderate Anglican, had, you know, put forward religious views um, using reason and science, as he was arguing for, um, he would be accused of heresy from all possible angles. You know, everyone would call him a heretic. So he thought, well, well wait. Well, I'm saying it's 400 years later now. I want a second edition of The Advancement of Learning uh, to be published in um, 2024, or thereabouts, um, <clears throat> and a sort of online thing. And because we know a lot more than in Bacon's time, learning has advanced vastly, but this time we would factor in religious things that we don't know about. I'm proposing we turn the advancement of learning on its head and we 
make a list in each discipline of things we don't know. So we ask the physicists, what don't you know? We ask the mathematicians, what don't you know? We ask the um, theologians, what don't you know? And that's, you see, that's the cutting edge where we should be working in all knowledge fields. We don't want them to rehearse endlessly what they know. Yeah, fine, they know that. We want them to tell us what they don't know still, in every field, sociology, literature, archaeology, history, you know, you name it. And so, <clears throat> well, what don't we know? <laughs> let me start, let, let me dive in here. One of the things that, um, if we apply scientific and mathematical method to religious studies, we can, I hope we can solve this problem of, of the, the fundamental mathematical puzzle at the heart of all theology. How many gods are there? This is the great battlefront. Okay, The world's divided into people that say there's one god. Those are most well, Muslims, most Jews, and, and most Christians. In different ways, however, complex, different ways. They affirm the, the, the unity, the monotheistic um, pole, the one. There are people that say that there's no God, they're the atheists, so they say the zero is the truth. Um, there are dualists who say that, well, there's good and evil, there's a good God and a bad God. They would be Zoroastrians and Mithraists and Zervanites, and um, some Christians, Jews and Muslims also have a strong duality at the root of their thinking, that there's a good and a bad a, a God versus a devil story going on. You know, the Book of Enoch and esoteric Christianity, Islam and Judaism have, have always had this dualism at its heart. I mean, read Christ's teachings. He's always, you know, attacking the devil and affirming the good God. And yet, paradoxically, he gets clobbered by the other religious believers for being possessed by a devil. I mean, so dualism is really in the air at Christ's um, lamentable and tragic and heroic, um, you know, <laughs> Um, tour de force um, but it wasn't resolved and dualism lasts on into Gnostic Christianity and uh, the Cathars, uh, one of the most famous examples and Marnie was a, a, a kind of well, a very important dualist who <clears throat> so these people believe in, the, in the, two, the two theory of God I would say and I would put Satanists in that bracket as well because Satanists there's a few of them about they believe in the dualist theory as well, but they, they take the side of Satan in the narrative. So they're against God, they're with Satan, and they, they, but they have a dualist sort of worldview. Um, most, most dualists take the God stand against Satan, but it became fashionable in 19th century Romanticism to stand up for the underdog and, and take the side of Satan, because he was the hero, the light bringer, the Lucifer, he was the god of the witches and some of the pagan groups. And so there was, it became, you know, very fashionable. And it still is in occult underground sects around Europe and, and, and the world to, to take Satan's view. Um, <clears throat> not all who do that would call themselves Satanists. They just call themselves pagans or Wiccans or something. But actually they're dualists <clears throat> following the two. Then there's the people that follow the three. So this is mainly Trinitarians, some Hindus... Um, who emphasise the Trimurti, you know, Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva, their trinity, and each has a consort. And also Christians, Trinitarian Christians, who, who believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit as the mediator and the, and the fruit. Um, now there are countless different divisions and, and tribes within Christianity, even among Trinitarians. There's Catholic, but even within that there are different branches and schools. It's interesting the Dominicans said they tried to resolve this problem by saying actually you can't reason this, you can't think it through theologically from first principles. It, the, the truths of faith are just givens, like the Trinity. You can't think your way to it. Um, you know, that seems to be a bit of a cop-out if you're going to be a theologian. I'm with Raymond Lowell who said, no, you can and must think it through <clears throat> from your own reason. I'm with Kant and others. But the Trinity idea is obviously very influential. I'd say the vast majority of Christians in the world are some kind of Trinitarian. Uh, so they're really worshipping a threefoldness. It's interesting the Druids, the Celts, also worship the threefoldness of God. So they count as proto-Christian Trinitarians. 
And off, um, Trinitarian Christianity often took very strong hold in, in areas that were prepared by the Druid um, you know, Trinitarian worldview. Um, because they thought God is a dynamic process. We would call it a dialectic. As Hegel, who was also a Trinitarian thinker of sorts, explained, it's, it's, it's a movement, a counter-movement, and a synthesis. And he tried to provide the logic of Trinitarian thinking. He was a Trinitarian Christian himself. Also, where he was from in, in the Rhineland is a strongly Druid Celtic region of what we now call Germany, but in the old days it was the place where Druids taught their Trinitarian stuff. So I always think it's quite fun that Hegel grew up in that region and went clambering on all the old Celtic ruins and stuff. Um, <clears throat> so there's the threefoldness. And then, um, you know, there's the many, because other religions emphasize, like the Nine, the Egyptian religion, that worships the Ennead, um, and Nine is quite a popular number for, for deity systems. Um, the Greeks had 12, 12 Olympians. Um, the Chinese had their own pantheon of, um, you know, countless deities who all lived on Kunlun Mountain which was the place of immortality, where the peach of immortality lives. And um, <clears throat> in my religious mathematics book, I have a series of visualizations, meditations, and at one point they go off to Kunlun Mountain, which is great fun. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then the Hindus say in the end of, at the end of the day, well, there must be 33 million deities. You know, that's, and counting. I mean, that's an extension of, of three, actually. Um, <clears throat> the fact is, well, in my book, I've raised the question, well, how many actually are there? Who's right in all this? Is it zero? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? Is it nine? Is it twelve? Is it eight? You know, what? So I'm going to propose something here. Now, this is kind of radical. Um, this is religious maths, uh, frontier stuff. What about, let's try a different logic. We're used to thinking it's got to be one or the other of these. <clears throat> It's got to be one. No, it's got to be two. No, it's got to be three. And that's been the cause of countless wars in history. The upholders of different numbers in theology have been fighting with other people. Uh, the monotheists have been fighting with um, other, other monotheists and also other um, you know, types of pluralists. Um, countless wars in history. Uh, still going on in, in some parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> what a pointless ridiculous waste of time you know why don't we say that it's all of them at once let's say that the true nature of god the true nature of the absolute the true nature of the gods is is simultaneously zero one two three four nine twelve infinity right how how does that work well i think that works quite well if we can if we can get our heads around a logic system which which allows it to be all things simultaneously I don't see how that's a problem, because, you see, if we choose it's only one, say, and no, there's an official declaration by the UN and, you know, some future world government, yeah, there is only one God, well, that's going to really disappoint all the dualists, it's going to disappoint the atheists, the zero people, it's going to disappoint, and you can put Buddhists and Jains in that zero class, because they tend to be sceptical about, about the nature of God, you know. Uh, it's going to really disappoint the Christians who've been doing their three thing. It's going to really disappoint the Hindus who prefer the three or the 33 million. So everybody's going to be upset. <clears throat> well, what if you say, no, no, it's the dualists. They're right. If officially we declare, no, dualism, there is a good and evil. There is a god and devil. Eternal battle. Come on, take your sides, guys. Um, well, that's going to disappoint everyone else that, that doesn't follow that dualistic thing. It's going to make... Um, People that want a monism, they want a unity, uh, really upset. <coughs> it's going to, you know, put the cat among the pigeons. And it's going to probably sanction religious wars till the end of time. Because if, if we end up with a sort of a combative dualism, you know, I don't see much hope for humanity. Perhaps a, a, a cooperative dualism like yin-yang, like Taoism... Well, that's possible. Taoism is a sort of dualism, but it's a co cooperative, a loving one. If we say, well, no, only the three is correct, the Trinitarian thing, 
Well, that's going to really upset all the Christians that aren't Trinitarian, the Unitarians, the Arians, and all their varieties. It's going to really upset the uh, the humanists. It's going to upset um, you know the Muslims who keep insisting that it's one one one. <coughs> it's going to upset everyone else that isn't a Trinitarian Christian. And to be honest, I mean, the fact is that Trinitarian Christianity wasn't really in the time of Jesus um, a, a proper thing. Jesus, I think, would come back and say, well, I don't really recognize this thing you call Trinitarian Christianity, you know. Uh, it's not what I was teaching. I mean, it's a sort of myth you've made up in, in, in retrospect about my life and work. Um, you know, it'd be really interesting to do an advanced masterclass with Jesus on, on personal identity and theological um, mathematics, because... I'm, sh I'm sure that Jesus, like everyone, had a sort of continuum of possible states of consciousness which, which embraced the unity, the diversity, the pluralism and so on. I mean, he'd been schooled, in my opinion, in advanced um, metaphysics, not just in the Kabbalah and Enochian tradition in, in Israel, but also in Egypt. I think he'd, he'd had spent some time studying Hermetic stuff. There's also evidence he may well have spent time in um, the, the Far East, India. Takshila and places. Some Buddhist scholars, you know, think there's a lot of evidence for that. So I suspend judgment, but I'm sure that he was a complex and multi-dimensional chap. And um, it's interesting that the word mathesis means disciple in the New Testament. Jesus had his mathematical students, his mathetes, and um, <clears throat> that's the word used in, in the Gospels for his students who were mathematicians. In the sense that the word mathetes simply means learning, learned. We, we call a mathematician someone that plays around with numbers, but actually it means someone that plays around with all kinds of wisdom, including cat wisdom and the love of nature. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I think that, that if, we, um, if we say simultaneously, no, it's the God forces all of these simultaneously, um, then nobody gets left out. Nobody is upset. We don't have any more religious wars. That, I think, should be the official announcement. Um, now, how would that work? Because, um, because if, if, surely logic, you know, it's either black or white. I mean, sure, we're all trained. Our brain thinks, you know, this is either a cat or a dog. It can't be both. Um, or an angel or a bodhisattva. No, it's got to be, you know, one or the other. Well, how about we look at what physics and maths can teach us about this? Let's go back to physicists and say, can we have a reality which can be more than one thing at once? Can we have a world in which zero, one, two, three, four are all valid kind of um, approaches to reality? And here we get interviewed by the quantum physicists who tell us actually, yes, that's how the world works. Well, this is very puzzling but mysterious. But um, So, as probably you know, quantum physicists have now discovered that reality, light, stuff that makes life possible, is simultaneously made of particles and waves. So, reality, my body, all the energy patterns that I'm made of, that, that sound is made of, that light is made of, that, that everything physical and material in the world, and also everything known to physics and science, all of that is, is simultaneously made of waves and particles. Um, and it depends how you look at it, and where you look at it, and the context in which you, you know, pin it down, um, whether it manifests as a wave or a particle form. In other words, it's both, and it has the potential to manifest as either. So, in other words, if you apply that, that hypothesis to... God theory, then the God force can appear sometimes as a one, that will make the monotheists very happy, sometimes as a zero, that will make the Buddhist Jains and atheists very happy, sometimes it can appear as a three, that makes the Trinitarian Christians very happy, sometimes as a four, that makes the Jungians and you know um, Greek Hellenist types all very happy, and and sometimes as you know all the other numbers. <clears throat> 